I start in the name of Allah, the Most High, and we send peace and blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad and his family and his followers until the end of time. Ameen. First and foremost, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's actually my first time coming to this facility, so it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to spend a few minutes with you all. And the topic that I was asked to address is the topic of Muslim youth in the West. Muslim youth in the West. So, there have to be kind of some opening remarks on the topic itself, and I think this is the easiest way to get to a deeper understanding of it. I actually won't, uh, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily particular. So I wouldn't say that the advices to Muslim youth is partic- are different if they're in the West versus the East. Uh, that's the first point. The second point is that I don't think that the West is monolithic. So a lot of times when we were in Egypt, for example, people would ask, how is Islam in the West? I said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, how is it in the West? I said, well, what do you mean by the West? I mean, the, UK, the United Kingdom is much different than France, if we want to talk about that. The French experience of Muslims is much different than the British experience. It's much different than the German experience, which is much different than... Spanish experience, for example. Uh, they say, well, no, what we mean is, uh, like, the West. <laughs> so, so, so do you mean Canada or do you mean the United States? We mean the United States. Okay, so what do you mean by the United States? Because New York is different than California, is different than the Midwest, is different than the South. And so the point here is to say that, yeah, we could talk about Muslim youth in the West. But I think what's actually more interesting to talk about, and perhaps then it will lead to maybe specifics to the West, is the question of what should Muslim youth in general be doing? So what is actually the issue of Muslim youth? And I think that this is multifaceted, but there are some particular things that we should point out. The first and I think most important part of any issue related to Islam is the issue of learning. And the fact of the matter is Muslim youth, you might have someone that, right before this I was in a discussion with our youth group. So one of the questions was, what if there's a Muslim kid who studies Christianity and they think that Christianity is actually correct and they decide that they're going to follow Christianity? And I said, I would think that they were wrong and that they probably didn't spend as much time studying Islam as they spent studying Christianity. Because had they studied equal, equally, then they would have stayed in Islam. So I think one of the issues is that many times we as young people we grew up in the, if I can still put myself in that category, we grew up in the United States, we grew up around our families, we grew up around our relatives, and we think that that's enough. Uh, and, and that's not enough. So all of us should try to seek to understand Islam in a deeper way. And in a more, uh, in a way that allows us to achieve a level of certainty. And if we don't reach a level of certainty, at least a level where we feel very confident. That we know what is it that I believe in, why do I believe in it, how does this make me unique, how does it make me different, how does it make me similar, what are the sources that I base that on, whatever it may be. Uh, So that's, that's the first side of it. And a very, very important side of it that takes time. Uh, Our culture, growing up, especially now, it's much different. My wife and I today were discussing this, that the difference maybe in some ways between the Muslim youth 10 years ago and today has a lot to do with social media. And we, uh, the conclusion we came to is that social media actually takes a lot of the devotion out of faith. Because there's a level of intimacy when we talk about our relationship with Allah. So when we're trying to develop as Muslims and we're trying to increase in our faith and our understanding and our knowledge and our practice, then we're engaging, engaging and we have ideas and we have to process those ideas. But if what happens every time we have an idea is that we put it out in front of people, then the devotional and intimate aspect of our relationship with Allah starts to chip away with time. It starts to not be about Allah, but it starts to be about other things. And so this, this concept of studying taking time, it takes time to learn, it doesn't just happen through Facebook posts, it doesn't happen even through attending lectures. It happens through seriously studying. I remember one time one of our teachers, we asked him about this concept of having a weekly study circle. 
And he said, the weekly study circle is not for learning. You don't become scholarly from a weekly study circle. In this case, they were talking about like in the community. Someone a little bit more learned will teach some other people. The idea is to increase in brotherhood, to increase in spirituality, but not necessarily to increase in knowledge. If you want to learn, you have to go. Day in and day out, read books, study, ask questions, deal with the bigger issues. But you have to do that. The pressures are great. If we do not understand exactly what it is that we're about and why, it's going to be very difficult to stand in front of those pressures. The second thing which is actually very intimately related to the knowledge side is the spiritual side. And by the spiritual side I mean the, the process and the important development of our hearts. Uh, we, ha we have a tradition where the Prophet, peace be upon him, and his family said that there's a morsel of flesh in the body, if it's not pure, then the whole body is affected. And if it's pure, then the whole body is pure. And this is the heart. That the heart actually, That Allah says, rather, it was their hearts were concealed by that which they used to do. And so there is a relationship between the mind and the heart actually. You know, Fir'aun, he said, وَمَا أَهْدِيكُمْ إِلَّا سَبِيلَ الرَّشَادِ He said to his people, I do not guide you except to the path of righteousness. Imagine, it's Fir'aun, it's the Pharaoh. Pharaoh was telling his people, I'm not guiding you except to righteousness. He thought he was right. So there's a very, he thought he was right. Because his heart was so messed up, his heart was so messed up that he couldn't even see wrong as wrong and he couldn't see right as right anymore. So there's a relationship between the intellectual and the spiritual. And this is why some of the scholars of spirituality, they said, in reference to those who do not engage in a process of purification, they mentioned them as, that they are those whose minds were concealed by the darkness and the cloud of sin. The darkness and the cloud of their desires, even more particularly, their desires. So when we talk about the path of spiritual development, the core element in the path of spiritual development is to go against one's base desires. To go against one's base desires. And this is something that is absolutely so important in a very, very deep way. And it's at the heart of everything. If you, one does not have enough discipline to go against their desires, it's going to be very difficult to do everything else. Probably the first place that we see this as Muslims on a daily basis is at Fajr. The first place you have to go against your desires and do what's right is to get up for Fajr. And one of our, our friends and colleagues used to always say, you know, people they talk about changing the world, they talk about helping the poor, aiding the oppressed, doing all these amazing things, but they can't lift their blanket to get up for Fajr prayer. If you can't lift your blanket to get up for Fajr prayer, what makes you think you're going to be able to stand for justice? A, there's a relationship between these things. And it all goes back to being able to discipline ourselves. To have a level of spiritual discipline so that I can do what needs to get done when it needs to get done. And that starts with getting up and praying on time. And that continues to any other number of things throughout the day. My father-in-law used to give this example. He said, if you have a child and you don't want the child to eat some candy. And you tell the child, don't eat this candy. Right, you take this, this very sweet and tempting water, candy. And you tell them, don't eat this candy. And you put the candy on top of the fridge where the child can't even reach it. And the child doesn't eat the candy. It's not really a big accomplishment, right? You know, this is the way we are sometimes. You say, well, I didn't do this and I didn't do this. Well, I don't have a haram relationship with any girls right now. Or I don't have a haram relationship with any guys right now. Okay. Could you have? <laughs> maybe you don't have one because you couldn't in the first place. Or maybe you don't have one because you don't. This is the big difference, right? So if you put the thing on top of the fridge and they don't take it and they can't reach it, it's not really a big success. But if you put the thing on the table, right in front of the child, and you tell the child, don't eat this candy, water, and you put it right in front of them, and they don't eat it, that's a success. This is mukhalafatun hawa. This is to go against one's desires. This happens so many times on a daily basis, I can't even tell you. You know the easiest one to practice now for us modern uh, individuals with smartphones and things that have destroyed our minds? The easiest way is 
you want to see if you follow your desires or not? Put your phone in your pocket, and the next time you have this feeling to check your Facebook, don't check it. This is the most applicable one now. And then two minutes later, you're going to have the feeling again. You're going to want to check it again because we're addicted. You just want to do whatever you want to do, you do it at that time. If we can't go against our desires, we can't succeed actually in all of the areas of development that we need. We can't succeed in the knowledge side because we're not going to have the patience. We're not going to have the patience. If we don't go against our desires, we're not going to have the patience when it comes to knowledge. Why? Because it's hard. You know, I didn't grow up in Islam. And when I accepted Islam, uh, I had a very big task ahead of me to learn how to read. And I don't mean that in the actual reading of letters way. I mean in the way to actually read correctly without falling asleep. So, like the introduction said, I went to UC San Diego. Alhamdulillah, I went to UC San Diego out of high school. So obviously I had good grades. But I didn't read. Sometimes I have discussions with my wife and she'll, I'll tell her, you know, this book. Did you read this book? This book is amazing. And she said, which book are you talking about? So I'll say, like, The Jungle. And she'll start laughing. She said, what were you doing in high school? You were supposed to be reading that in high school. All of this stuff was curriculum. But I didn't read. So I had to go through a very difficult process of learning how to sit down for more than five minutes and read a book without falling asleep. But eventually you get to 10 minutes, eventually you get to 15 minutes, eventually you get to 20 minutes, eventually you get to studying 6, 8, 10 hours a day. Right? But that takes a lot of discipline. If you want to get physically fit, which is part of Islam, which is part of Islam, being in shape is part of Islam. You know, this is what my brother-in-laws, they're very strict about this. They used to tell me, they're like, look, you have to be careful because we have a rule that we don't listen to anyone, we don't listen to an imam that's overweight. <laughs> I said, okay. Because they're very fit, mashallah. And they're like, this is the sunnah. If you don't follow the sunnah and staying in shape, then I don't want to listen to you. <laughs> like there's something wrong in your life. You're not, you're not balancing things properly and you're not putting the effort in. Because if you put the effort in, you'll be in. Because how many things related to going against your desires relate to being in shape? You have to plan your day so that you have time to exercise. You have to do the exercise itself. You have to do the exercise itself for more than a week. You know, the first week or two of exercise, it's all fun, everybody's excited. But two weeks later, three weeks later, two months later, three months later, it gets a little bit tiresome. But you have to continue. Uh, you have to watch what you eat. Which is one of the biggest areas also of going against one's desires. So all of these are interrelated. So we won't, if we don't get this habit of going against our desires, we can't develop intellectually. We also cannot develop spiritually. Because there's, developing spiritually is not about following our desires. It's about following what's true and right and good and beautiful. And that's not always what people tell you is true and right and good and beautiful. So this goes back to the first one about knowledge. So you engage in this. You engage in this and with time, with going against our desires, we're able to accomplish that. So these are two routes to go down. Right? Two foundations. Two foundations that absolutely have to be there. There has to be the knowledge track and there has to be the spiritual development track for Muslims who are young, anywhere. Anywhere. It doesn't matter where you are. If you don't do these two things, you will not succeed. The third one that is maybe has a little bit of a subtlety that's particular in our context, but it really depends and it applies across the board. Which is that we should always uh, have an understanding of history. Of course, we may have different understandings of history, but we should still study history. And as Muslims, if we don't study history, we don't know what we have. And when you're under always constant attack, and you don't know what your history is, it's very easy to get defensive. It's very easy to actually crumble in the face of the onslaught of the things that are going on around you. So there's three histories that every... Muslims should know. And this is a little bit switched for the West. So three histories that every Muslim in America should know. The first history is the history of the Prophet ﷺ and his family and his followers. That early generation of Muslims, that history should be known. Without a doubt. And it should be known and studied over and over again and repeated. Because this, you know, uh, I'll come back to this point. I'll come back to it. The second one is that Muslims in America should know the history of the place where their parents come from. Under the assumption that the kids themselves have not uh, immigrated, but they should, know the they should know the history of the place where their family comes from. 
And I'll be very honest with you, I failed in this regard. My father's from Pakistan and my mom is from Canada. And I know very little about the history of either of those places. But still, the theory applies, which is that we should know it. And we should have an appreciation for it. One of the saddest things that I see is when Muslim kids are raised here and they lose the language of their parents. That's a disaster. It's a disaster on so many fronts. I can't even begin to tell you how many fronts it's a disaster on. Because it's not just about the religion per se. It's not just about uh, your cultural heritage. It's about who you are. You know, they have this, uh, this uh, proverb kind of, that when you learn a language, you add another person to your being. That if you learn another language, you speak one language, you're one person. If you speak two languages, you're two people. If you speak three languages, you're three people. So like my son, for example, we're hoping that he will speak three languages, minimum, uh, from the time that he starts speaking. Because you lose stuff. I can't tell you, I, like my relationship, for example, with my father's side of the family is limited. Because I don't speak Urdu. Even if I wanted to have a relationship with them, I could pick up the phone and call them and I have nothing to say. Salaamu Alaikum, that's it. That's what we share. <laughs> and just repeat Alhamdulillah over and over again, right? <laughs> and then you end the call. So, if you don't have the language, you can't connect. You can't hear the stories of your grandparents, you can't hear the stories of your aunts and your uncles, you, you don't understand the context, you don't understand the place, and to even get images in the language and in the history to get images. One of the things I was trying to do with my father-in-law recently was ask, like, what happened when you left Afghanistan? Because they were from the generation that was forced out. So he was telling about the journey and he talked about how they stopped at this masjid along the way. So I asked him, what did the masjid look like? You want to have more than just the raw facts. You want to be able to imagine it. Because when we can imagine it, especially for people who are born and raised here and haven't really seen anything else, it's really important. Because not everyone lives the way that we live here. That was the biggest lesson that I got from living in Egypt. The third history that every single Muslim should know is the history of the place that they live in. We have to know the history of the place that we live in. So we should know, for example, that tomorrow is the beginning of... Is it tomorrow? Today is the 31st, right? Yeah. Tomorrow is the beginning of Black History Month. We should know some things about Black History should know about the struggles that Muslims went through here as African Americans. We should know about the Red Power Movement. We should know about the uh, Chicano Power Movement. We should know about the, um, the anti-lynching movement. We should know about what happened to the Japanese after World War II. We should know about these things. These are part of our history uh, as people who are inhabiting this space. And all of these things we have to know in order to fulfill actually our responsibility as believers. And our responsibility as believers is to stand for the truth and spread the truth. And if you're not able to speak to somebody, how are you going to be able to have any sort of conversation with them? Which goes beyond uh, just, just the, the language, the words. The words is the beginning of it. But shared history and narratives and to be able to reference things that other people are able to reference as well. So these are three histories that we should know. One of the reasons why it's so important to know history is because history is basically his stories. They just hopefully are true in most, in some cases. And stories are very important to our development. There's research that shows how people, people who grow up in families where storytelling is common, they have more resilience. So you face difficulties in life, maybe there's something in front of you that you, you're not used to, you're not sure if you can overcome it, you don't know how to deal with this problem. You have stories that you can reference. That's why one brother, or one of the other imams actually, last week we had an issue that was kind of very um, traumatic in some ways. And he sent a message afterwards that night. He, had to actually, he went and he taught a class on the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And so he sent a message afterwards and he said, if you ever feel like you can't, you're being overcome with the difficulties of life and responsibility and stuff. Go teach about the life of the Prophet. Because if you do that, you're going to find everything you need. So you're going to be able to understand. Like the, the amazing thing about the life of the Prophet is that there's so many elements in it. Someone would say, for example, I don't know, I don't know how to deal with this situation because I come from a single parent family. So, so did he. 
I don't know how to deal with this situation because I'm poor. So was he. I don't know how to deal with this situation because of this or that. Like any kind of issue you can think of, you find either in his life or his family or his followers. You'll always find it. So if these stories are there, you have a reservoir. So you face a difficulty, and this is the same thing that applies to stories about your own family. Families that tell the stories about their immigration, about the struggles, about the things that they went through. It broadens the horizon and gives a level of strength and resilience in the face of any sort of difficulties or trials that we might have. So this is the second element. The third and last point is uh, related to culture. And culture is a very kind of complicated question. It's a very, people write PhDs on culture. But culture is very, very important to think about. However, I do not think, my, my, I would like to posit that we will not be successful as Muslims in this country as long as we try to copy our cultures from back home and apply them here. I don't think that this will work. Does that mean that we should leave entirely the things that we have in our cultures and just adopt everything that people do here? Not necessarily either. But the discussion is how to find that middle ground. The analogy that's sometimes given is the analogy of a river. Say so that Islam is like a river, and depending on what is at the bedrock of the river, it looks slightly different. So if, it's, if the river goes over red, then it has a red tint to it. If it goes over green, it has a green tint to it, or a brown tint to it, or whatever it may be. But the river itself is the same. This is like Islam in different places. So if you look at Islam, in any number of countries around the world, you'll see different subtleties of practice. Generosity is there across the board. It might be shown in slightly different ways. Uh, the way people dress covers the same thing, but it will be expressed in slightly different ways, and so on. So the, the, one of the big challenges we have as Muslims in America is to figure out how we can create and sustain a cultural identity that is not foreign to our existence in the United States while at the same time being true to our values and shifting even the cultural perspective of what people do here. So it's not just a success, like it wouldn't be a success to have a Muslim community uh, that's generous or so on, that's, that's hopefully given. But the success would be to transform the way that our general society thinks about generosity. So usually with Muslims, when you go to a restaurant or something, you don't, you don't go Dutch. You know, in the U.S. they call it going Dutch. In Colombia they call it doing a, going Americano. It's doing it the American way. So I guess different countries blame other countries, which is, I guess, usually uh, something that happens. But usually we end up fighting with each other at the cash register, right? So you go and you order some things and then there's a little bit of a tussle about who's going to be paying and the person who's taking the bill looks at you like you're crazy. Because like, who are these people? They're fighting over who gets to pay, right? So it would be a success, I would say, if that became normal. Like, if with the norm then, if we culturally were able to present this beautiful thing culturally, this issue of being generous is a beautiful thing. So how can we present within our context, that issue of generosity in a way that everyone else will pick it up and they want to be like that too. That's the big question. So it's not only about adapting to the place that we're in without losing our values, but it's also about presenting something that's so beautiful that other people want to be like you. And sometimes this happens in weird ways or it happens in different ways. Um, I'll give two examples or maybe three that will show this. It's, it's not always, sometimes it's random things. Like in Philadelphia, for example, uh, there was a period at least where there's a lot of Muslims who believe that their pants can't be below their ankles. So they would have their pants always like above their ankles, sometimes mid calf, and they would do this out of their religious conviction. And it became so normal and common in certain areas of Philadelphia that it got a nickname with non Muslims. So a non-Muslim would see it and they'd be like, oh, you flooding? You're flooding, okay. Like, this is what they, they would call it, like if someone puts their pants up, they're flooding because it's like there's water, and they pulled their pants up, right? So it became a cultural practice. Non-Muslims would do it, Muslims would do it, and it became something normal. Uh, one time another brother was telling me in DC 
he went into a barber shop and he sat down in the barber shop and he told him, you know, just like, how to say this in an appropriate way, you know, clean me up a little bit. And then uh, he said, but don't touch my beard. So the barber, who's a non Muslim, he looks at him and he says, oh, you going Sunnah? Like, this is, you have cultural weight. If the non Muslim barber is looking at you and saying, oh, you're going Sunnah? Like, he knows, okay, a lot of Muslims are coming in here, they're telling him, don't cut my beards. And it becomes common that. All people in the area start wearing beards, and they wear beards, and they say like, okay, hook me up with the sunnah, which means don't clean up my beard that much, when you sit at the barber seat. It's pretty incredible when you think about it, right? Another example of this uh, is from the Nation of Islam, although obviously we take issue with some of, the, uh, some of the theological beliefs, but nonetheless there's sociology that we can benefit from, is that the Nation of Islam was very well respected. In the inner cities in the United States, they were very well respected. You know, someone would dress up in this way and put a bow tie on. They put a bow tie on and people would look at them and say, that's a Muslim. They're putting on something that's completely not foreign at all to the environment that they live in and they're known still to be a Muslim because of it, number one. And number two, the assumption would be that this person is a disciplined, strong, and respectable person. So people want to be like them. So the question is, how do we develop ourselves with the excellence that's required of us in Islam in the context that we live in, to be such that others want to be like us. They look at you and they say, I want to, I want to be like them. The last story I'll, I'll end with is some, a guy that I know, he, he had a secretary. A secretary is not Muslim. And another guy, another third co-worker, one time he was telling this, the secretary about how, you know, this guy, he's so good. He's, he's a nice guy, he's always on time, he, he works hard. And the secretary, who's not a Muslim, looked at him and said, yeah, he would make a good Muslim. So think about what her impression of Islam is. <laughs> if she's not a Muslim, and she's saying, yeah, that guy who has all those good qualities, he would make a good Muslim. So this means that you're putting something out there that other people want to be like. And this actually is not only the, the priority or the prerogative of Muslims in the West, but it's definitely an added emphasis in our context that we should be like that. You're not going to make everyone happy. But as long as we know ourselves and we stand by what we believe in with generosity and with, uh, with patience and forbearance and gentleness, then it'll be okay, inshallah. So I'll stop here. Uh, if there's a few minutes, if anyone has any questions, they can be personal, they can be related, they can be unrelated, it can be about anything you want. It doesn't bother me.